The Basic is not really an action movie. The basic only appears to be an action movie. The basic is a military thriller, a murder mystery. So pretty. So gay. I like that it's a movie this big that takes some risks and goes in some, some dark places and some avenues that, that your sort of average summer military thriller doesn't do. Let me explain what 15 years of interrogation work has taught me. Murder is basic. I just don't think he's capable of murder. How long have you been doing this? What does that have to do with anything? That means less than a year. Osborne, murder is basic. No, no conspiracies, conspiracies, no, no grand, grand mysteries, mysteries no, no, no puppet, puppet masters, masters behind the all the pulling the strings. Pulling the string. So when second guy tells you that first guy did it, 99% of the time, first guy did it. Dunbar's our guy. <sighs> when I sort of first sat down was I took a yellow legal pad and I sort of marked out where we were going. I, I know we're gonna be here on page 10. I know we gotta be here on page 20. Um, and just sort of gave myself signposts. I know this twist has gotta come around here. Um, enough so that I had a road map, but not so much that all the spontaneity was taken out of it. Any spooks involved here? CIA, FBI? Not exactly. What's that mean? In 1983, Reagan authorized a full-scale drug war. Covert ops, assassinations, the whole nine. A group of rangers who would go in, kill the bad guys, and get out, no questions asked. The guys who fought it were like ghost soldiers. No dog tags, no dental records, no families. No dog tags, no dental records, families, nothing. They were recruited out of the rangers. They were recruited out of the rangers. I made that up. Yeah. There are a lot of different fictions in the movie. They're ghosts, right? They're, they're dead. This could all be a story. None of this could be true. Section 8 came from, again, I made it up, but it's, um, Section 8 came from the idea of, of, I mean, I, you know, I feel the government does, you know, go out and do stuff and, and try and take care of, you know, the drug war down in Panama and, and, and take care of those things, you know. We may not know about it. We pro it's probably better we don't know about it, but I don't think it's an incredibly far-fetched, you know, thing to believe that there is a group of soldiers who go out and do this. Most of the research I did was, you know, sort of military publications. Um, I read the entire Ranger Handbook, which is about this thick in 10-point print. Um, and so I, I know how to enter a room like a Ranger pretty well now. Um, I don't think I'll be demonstrating that. But, uh, you know, I did a lot of that. I talked to um, several people in the military. I also talked to a guy who's a homicide detective um, about interrogation. Look, we got enough on you to deep fry your ass. Back to silent treatment. Bye, bye me, I'm just gonna have to hire him. One of the ins for me about the movie was the idea of a guy who is, you know, not the, not the best guy with a gun, not the best guy with his fist, the, the best guy with his mouth. Um, and I thought that was sort of a cool character we hadn't seen. Ho, ho, time out, time out. Look, Ray, this is what you call good cop, bad cop. She shouts, I stand up for you. you, you you're grateful, this establishes some sort of bond of trust. I don't wanna play games with you. So I did a lot of research in terms of interrogation techniques, how people go about getting stuff out of other people. Interrogator translator stuff is what the CIA calls it. You can tell us to fuck off and you'll be hanged. Now, am I scratching your surface yet? Party came from just the idea of the, the, the best the best interrogator in the room, the best guy to walk into a room and put everybody at ease and and get anything out of you. I know I've known just a couple just normal guys in my life who can walk into a room and you meet them and ten minutes later you tell them your deepest darkest secrets, um, and there are just people out there like that. Um, and I read several books. I was very interested sort of in interrogation long before this and several books sort of about how you go about that and about disarming people. And I thought that that's a sort of a fantastic world that hasn't really been explored that much yet. So he's self-assured. Does he, does he carry himself well? Does he look you in the eyes or down at the floor? Does he have good bones which suggest good breeding? Does he slouch or sit up straight? These are important questions. Does they reveal a great deal about this man's character? Now, look, get over yourself for two and a half seconds and tell me, is, is he, he cute? cute? The other thing I really wanted to do with Party was was sort of take a guy who, to a certain extent, is 
a, a, an atypical movie hero. You know, you meet him in the beginning. He's, you know, he hasn't shaved. He drinks. He's, you know, in trouble at his job. He's down and out. And the audience always goes, oh, don't worry. He'll be okay. He's a nice guy. I swear, you know. You know, and, and you're sort of telling the audience, this guy is what he seems. This guy is is in some in some stuff that that you don't know about and you know he might kind of be a bad guy a little and the audience goes no no he's not he's just down on his luck he's john travolta he's been working out he's great and so i love the idea of you telling the audience all this stuff right up front um and then at the end of the movie you kind of go i told you we kind of you know we kind of put it right out there in the beginning that he's not necessarily what he seems and he's you know sort of a liar a little bit of a cheat and you know and uh i really like that idea are you drinking again? No, no, nothing like that. Anytime a cocaine dealer suspected of bribing an agent, we pull him off the assignment and run a check. It's nothing personal. A drug lord that I help bust says that he paid me off and you guys believe him and say it's nothing personal? Fuck you. A huge trap to fall into as, as a writer is all the, all the supporting characters you have all this fun with, um, but not your hero. Because your hero must be good and straight and pure and usually boring because of that. And Hardy was sort of a, you know, an attempt uh, at least in my mind, to take a character who would be sort of the, the interesting side character or the best friend or the guy who will always say whatever is on his mind and put him front and center in a picture. Hello. You try poking him with a stick? Oh, how about them Yankees? I had a blast with him. You know, he and West, really, were, were the characters I think I had the most fun writing, um, whereas Osborne, I think, is the character I sort of had the most fun peeling the onion with, you know, and sort of slowly, you know, discovering. Sir, I am Julia Osborne. I am the provost marshal here. Osborne, do I look like a sir to you? Not particularly, sir. What I tried to do, and I, and I hope I succeeded at this, was, was, was write a character with Osborne who isn't sort of just the naive girl that you find in these movies, you know. Um, one, she's the hero of the picture. Uh, you know, two, she's the one we're, we're going through all this with. Three, she has the learning curve. I mean, she improves. She learns, I think, from Hardy in terms of interrogation um, and then kind of bests him at the end, you know? She, she kind of tops him and figures it out. So I, I, I like the idea because a lot of these movies, there's, you know, a lot of manly men doing manly men things and then there's the, the, the hot girl who doesn't really do much. And I think Osborne's a bit of a reaction um, to those types of flicks. The one rule I had through it, and, and we had through developing the script after it was bought, was the audience has to always be in lockstep with Osborne. Whatever she knows, they know. And whatever she doesn't know, they don't know. And in that way, sort of, if, you, if we adhered to that rule, get we'd be okay. And here you are going out of house. Now, how's that make you feel, Jules? Hostile and uncooperative, sir. Fantastic. One of the scenes that didn't make it into the movie is after the first interrogation of Dunbar, they're driving over to the hospital, um, and it's a character scene. And usually in movies like this, the character scenes are the first things to go, just to keep the pacing up. Um, but it, what it really was is sort of Osborne's backstory and where she came from, um, the fact that she's from a military family, the fact that she went into this because, you know, there's sort of no other, no other way in it. Um, and so she's, to a certain extent, living in, not in the shadow of her parents, but she's living her parents' life to a great extent. So, tell me, uh, Osborne, now why did you join the Army? Now, I'm sorry if I've been abrupt, but I've had a bad day. Oh, as opposed to the rest of us? I have four kids and a legend dead. A CEO thinks I'm incompetent and a civilian clown. And when he's not belittling my intelligence, keeps staring at my ass. I surrender. I lay my arms down and I beg your forgiveness. That sounded heartfelt. Look, we've got to work together, and I'm telling you, we better be in sync and play off each other. Not set each other up? Deal. And I wasn't looking at your ass. Maybe a little bit, but strictly in a professional way. You do understand that there is no way in this world I would ever be attracted to you. Understand, but do not accept. Plan to grow on you. The other thing about the scene is that Hardy comes after pretty hard about it, is why are you doing this? Did you make your family proud? And so right from the beginning in the script, he's probing her as much as he's probing the guys he's interrogating. Now tell me why you joined the army. I'll take this pen and I'll jab it to your neck. It's family business. My dad was non com, my mom was a nurse. Did you make your mom and dad proud? You want the Dom Star psychoanalysis version? All right, now did it work? What about you? Oh, you are avoiding the question. 
I certainly am. The other scene that's deleted uh, comes near the end of the film. Uh, and it's it's right after Dunbar's final Dunbar Pike's final interrogation, um, and before Hardy goes and confronts Styles, uh, some of the the expositional stuff in that scene ended up making into the reshot ending with Tim Daly and John Travolta. But originally, this was the moment that Hardy really sort of came to realize it was his friend behind all this stuff, um, and he didn't want to. And again, it was it was more of a character scene about Osborne and Hardy. There's a law against breaking and entering. That was a hurricane. Tree broke that door down. Oh well, yeah, same tree broke that lock. No, that was me. But I put a fifty there. You want a beer? You know, Hardy, you're a good man. You know, I mean, <laughs> it's a good thing. Why are you buttering me up? Transfer orders. Really? Where are you going? I'm not going nowhere. Someone else's. Come on, Hardy, we've come this far. Yeah, we have come this far. Now leave it. Why? Because Bill is a friend of mine, okay? Do it myself. Fuck. This is the moment he lets down his guard. Um, the, the reason that the scene was taken out, and I, and I agree with the choice, is the plot is moving so fast at this point that it would have ground it to a halt, I think, for four or five minutes. Um, when the audience would have already known Styles as the bad guy. Um, and, you know, once, you get an, once the audience knows something like that, every second you spend with them ahead of you is killing you and is killing the movie. What the fuck are you talking about? I'm talking about, about West. You're the fucking base commander here. You're the fucking base commander. You knew what he was capable of and you stood by. You know what he's all about and you stood by. It was just a matter of time till somebody fragged his ass. It was just a matter of time before someone fragged his ass. And you know what? He deserved it. Now there, there's your fucking confession. West is sort of based on, you know, what, what would be, if I were in basic training, what, who would be the scariest man on earth to me? Have you lost your fucking mind? Sorry, didn't you tell me to Are relig- you talking? Did you speak to me? With West, I was really trying to do is create this larger than life guy. In the screenplay, you haven't seen him yet, which is an important thing. I kept him off screen. In the movie, we open on him, which I think works great because it's Sam Jackson, so you don't need to build him up. It's Sam Jackson, and he's terrifying. So please keep those weapons safety so as not to shoot off your non-existent dicks. In the screenplay, just on the page, what I really wanted to do is create this larger-than-life guy. And, and sort of screenwriting 101, the, one of the best ways to do that is keep the have other people talk about the guy. And we're gonna talk about this, and he's got a knife, and he did this thing with it. And you're just building up and building up and building up to his entrance. Hey, why don't you ask him about all the murders he's covered up for his drug dealer? Hey, did, did it ever weigh on your conscience, or did you just, or did you just not think about it? <laughs> the original <laughs> ending, in the first draft of the script, had Hardy being actually the villain, uh, and having killed West. John McTiernan came onto the project, and the first time we sat down with him, they just sort of cast it. And uh, we're having dinner, and he looks at me and he says, you can't kill Sam Jackson. And I said, well, what are you talking about? He said, well, you can't kill Sam Jackson. He said, maybe if somebody else were playing the part, it would work. But Sam Jackson is the most righteous man in America. And if we kill him, they will burn the screen. So it was McTiernan's idea to keep Sam alive. Um, which is sort of the great capper on, on the picture when he steps out from behind Connie. Tom? I knew I had all of that, and I worked backwards from it. I said, you know, how can, you know, how can we do this and play fair, play fair enough with the audience but not let them figure it out? So I know these guys are alive. I know that, that Hardy knows they're alive, you know, and sort of been working with them. And so you track back, and you have all those little moments with where are the bodies. You have moment, a moment with Dunbar. You know, they both smoke the same brand of cigarettes. My brand. My lucky day. You, know, you have the moment in the shower where he's Ooh. washing mud off of himself. <sighs> there are a lot of little tricks and clues tricks. and stuff like that. You have the moment where Kendall looks at him and realizes that you're full of shit, realizing who this guy is. You're full of shit. You are fucking full of shit and why this guy's here. We specifically designed what I call second viewing moments, where second time you see the picture, you go, oh, oh, wait, and that, that there, I mean, I hope it works that way, but ultimately it was, 
knew as long, I always had the ending. You're all Section 8. I told you she was smart. Oh, you said she was. What did you say she was? Hot. Ooh. <laughs> well, yes, ma'am. We're officially Section 8. That was the whole goal, was to get to that, that moment and just ratchet you around. Um, and and I, wanted to make, I wanted to make a movie that would fool the people who go to the movies that fool most people and go, I knew who the killer was 10 minutes in, you know? So hopefully I succeeded. <laughs> I love those stories where somebody comes in, tells you the story, and then the next guy comes along and tells you the same story. And it's different. And so you start to find out, okay, well, one of these two guys is lying. And as you know, in this film, you know, everybody's lying. Basic is a military thriller, murder mystery. It's not really a, a murder mystery. It's more of an intelligent action movie. Basic is not really an action movie. Basic only appears to be an action movie. It's essentially a Rashomon type story. I mean, I just keep dying. I've heard from a number of people a comparison of this to Rashomon. Um, it's true, there is, and there isn't. It's a different story, and it's told in a different way. It's a puzzle that one has to figure out. I thought that the film was basically a, you know, it's a, it's a romance thriller. I never saw it as a romance. I read this actually when I was shooting another military movie. See, this isn't really a military movie. My father used to read me Hardy Boys books. And I finally learned to read because I couldn't wait for like the next night for him to get to the next chapter. I was like, screw it, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna finish the ending. And so like the first thing I ever really got into was murder mysteries. And that's actually why uh, John Travolta's character is named Tom Hardy. The first version of the script had us all bad guys. We were all in on the take. John decided that, that you know, he didn't want to wind up being a bad guy, so we actually had to retwist the story, if you will. We were all in on the murders. We were all as bad as you get. No relief. We love the first half. <laughs> now, can we make the second half represent the same sort of thing? You write the script, and you're like, oh, this is a great mystery, and then somebody goes, well, what about that? Why did that happen? You go, well, because it did. OK, I'll go change that. <laughs> it was cool in a certain way, but it was too dark. It was like what Reservoir Dogs was compared to Pulp Fiction. It's like Pulp Fiction had some levity to it, some lightness mixed with the darkness. Reservoir Dogs only had darkness. Oh, God. No word, no word. John is a bad boy. <laughs> That's the essence of his connection with the audience. And he has so much joy in being bad. What my work was, to some extent, was to shape the part to John. Hello. He's sparky and he's mischievous and he's, and he's just a little outrageous. No matter what he's doing, he's having a wonderful time doing it. I had to find ways to let that show through and not get burdened with too much of the nitty-gritty mechanics of murder investigations. Connie Nielsen said, why don't you sing something for us? And kind of every time we're together, we, we've, been, we've been singing. But he's great, though. He likes to hog the ending. He likes to get the big high note. They like his smile. They like his persona. Pretty much till the end, you're not sure whether the character is a good guy or a bad guy. This is what you call good cop, bad cop. She shouts, I stand up for you. You, you, you're grateful, this establishes some sort of bond of trust. He brings that kind of cockiness to it. That's really what makes it work. I didn't know what to expect, you know, he's an icon. It was good to see that his passion, after all these years, with his success and his time and his business, he's still incredibly passionate about acting. Wait, now you can just stop right there. I was there, okay? I was tortured by that guy, okay? I wanted him dead 15 years ago. And now you're telling me I should feel bad about someone who offed him? Forget it. No can do, sister. I really wanted him to be there at all times behind the camera because he just really loved being in that character and, it, and he would just do something to me that would just make me feel like, you know, you're, 
you're Brad. <laughs> you really don't like me, do you? <laughs> and it would just come off immediately that, you know, we had this really funny competition going at all times. And that, of course, just worked perfectly for the Saints. <laughs> Mr. I've had it with you. <laughs> okay, so, are you happy? As a fighter in this particular sequence, he wants to be as good as he can be. John is terrific to work with because of that. He... Certainly a dancer are the easiest people to teach karate to because they have extension. They can throw kicks without losing their balance, where most of us are, are tightened up when you throw a kick, it throws us off balance. The most fun about it was putting Connie and John against one another. Sort of like you take two cats and you get a nice dark closet and you throw them in and slam the door closed. Is that a no? McTiernan forced me to wear these boots, which were so uncomfortable. I had to do all kinds of things with these huge um, boots. He'll do stuff like put weights in your boots to change the whole gait, you know, to kind of make you sit, sit more like a man, your, your whole carriage. They made me sort of slouch and sort of like walk, like, you know, very slouchy. <laughs> so I actually had to train myself to walk more like a military person in spite of the boots. She went mano a mano with McTee and said, you know, I don't want to wear these, they're too heavy, they feel too clunky. They kept arguing and he said, no, this one I'm not going to let go on. No, no, we no. cut all her hair off and she was completely game. She hated the tie. Wouldn't stop going on about that Girl Scout tie. And uh, she was like, give me a real tie. Um, she practically wanted me to put a sock in the, in the trousers. I gave her a, in effect, a personal military trainer. Who, who spent quite a while with her taking her around to bases and introducing her to the life of a woman in the military. All they wanted to do was serve their country and uh, take a stand and protect assholes like you. This is a career like any other career. However, it does entail the idea that you might be called uh, into war. Don't you talk to me like, like some goddamn recruiting poster, because I did my yeah. time. It's a job that means something that is ideologically motivated, and I use that for my character very much. You were like me once, you know? You believed in the whole honor and duty thing and, and trying to make a difference in the world. Isn't that what you said? I was trying to get your number. She is also, in a way, the guide through this maze, uh, in a way for the audience. She is the only person who is not pretending to be someone else. The French tried to build a canal here before the Americans. She is like Scout in To Kill a Mockingbird, which is what I was sort of trying to suggest with the narration at the beginning of the movie. And you see the ships and things, and it all sounds kind of sweet until you realize she's talking about shiploads of corpses. I always thought it was a great setup for the notion of corruption and illusion in this story. Because it's the little Florida girl's voice, I think it helps the audience catch on to, oh, things in this story are not exactly what they seem. Tom, why did this young woman have a weapon pointed at your head? She thinks I killed you. <laughs> it's great to be back with Sam. I wish we had more scenes to be with each other. I find that with any great actor, other actors become better instantly because they give them the confidence. With Sam, I instantly became a better actor. The difficult thing with the part that Sam was playing, and particularly why I wanted to do it with Sam, is that the guy's kind of a holy terror. There's something just wonderful about him, and especially if he's being a really badass guy. He's the most intimidating guy in the world in this film. And uh, what I wanted to do with the character was introduce him as somebody who's just scary as hell. Tell me this, what is your weapon? Your weapon, son, your weapon. What keeps you alive and makes the other guy die? What is your weapon? It's your brain, Mr. Pike. Your noggin, your noodle, your smarts, your gray matter, your poise under fire your wits when all about you are losing theirs. I think you came to this party unarmed, Mr. Pike. If you look at him from the exterior, he's a very hard, cold, mean, no-nonsense kind of guy. But that's the kind of guy that he has to be. Just because he's training a group of people to go out and do some things that could get them killed. And if they make mistakes while they're being trained, 
then they're going to die. Me today. Those of you I deem unworthy will not remain. Is that understood? Can I get a hoo-ha, Sergeant? Hoo-ha, Sergeant! Those of you I find lacking will quit. And those of you who refuse to quit will have a training accident. To some people, you know, Sam would be psychotic. To, to, you know, I'm sure to people who've been in the military who I've talked to, their drill sergeants were insane. Uh, to other people who, you know, who were in the military and turned, you know, became drill sergeants, you know, they told me, listen, it's very calculated, the intimidation, what we put them through, you know, it, it bonds them together and, and it's completely unpsychotic. It's an old part in, in our heritage. You know, it goes back through Lou Gossett doing it with Richard Gere, back to John Wayne doing it in Sands of Iwo Jima. The character of Sergeant West's feeling is, it's better for me to be hard on these guys here and humiliate them and hurt them and, and put them through hell than for me to send them overseas and have them get killed because I was nice to them. This base suffers three training accidents a year. Unfortunate accidents that I will not hesitate to repeat if you cross me. Is that understood? Give me a hoo-ha, Sergeant. Hoo-ha, Sergeant! And he's a good screamer. He's a, he screams loudly in my ears. Who's the best actor in Hollywood if you write a role for someone who yells at other people? If I see anybody drag ass, I swear to God, you will swim the canal. The younger actors almost method-like stayed away from me in a way, just because I was the character that I was and they were who they were. They didn't talk to me that much. Uh, on set. You surrender, I take you in. I know it sounds like a shitty deal, but you get to live. I'll go my way, and you go yours, okay? Not gonna happen. You either surrender, or we die where we stand. So what's it gonna Charge! be? Ah! Raymond Dunbar, he was a juicy, meaty character, a multi-layered character that was a huge opportunity for an actor to play. Brian Van Holt, He's got such a straight ahead, normal American manner about him, and it survives on camera. Ryan Van Holt wanted to really wear Kevlar, which is where he's like, you know, and we, you know, because that was him, he, that helped him find his character. As soon as I saw him, I said, you know, I gotta get this kid in this movie. You saw West Body, how was he killed? His chest was hamburger, Jake. See, that's close range. You go full auto on somebody close range? They're gonna be swimming in blood. Look at me. I don't have a drop on me. In the first meeting, I said, Tay Diggs would be great for Pike. And you cut to two and a half years later, and I'm in Florida with him. An amazing actor, very well trained, very eloquent, and also looks tough as nails. You will be charged with right. murder! Hey! Shut up, Pike. Mueller! You will be caught hey, 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 Shut up, up you up? dumb fucking you nigger! Fucking white Put your mother Shut up, I saw you do it! <laughs> There's a chance that if I ever did become a soldier, I kind of think that in the right circumstances, I could be a really great killing machine because I'm athletic and, and when I get angry, I sort of go black, you know, the world closes in like that because I'm Irish and I, I, when I go, I go big. There was a group of guys down here who were way out on the hairy edge. They were renegade. Who knows about this? How the hell do I know? They're ghosts, right? They're they're dead. This could all be a story. None of this could be true. I like Tim Daly a lot. I like him personally, and I like his work. I think he had no pretensions. He just said, hey, I want to play that part. Duties until further notice. Yes, sir. You'll be lucky if I don't put you in for a court-martial. He was dirty, Bill. He's dead, Tom. Giovanni Ribisi, who's such a great actor, was is a method actor, and he's, he gets profoundly into the role. I mean, you know, he didn't take a bath for a week. My, my costume department was like, you know. He tried to pin three stone murders in Dunbar. Hey, why don't you ask him about all the murders he's covered up for his drug dealer? Hey, did, did it ever weigh on your conscience, or did you just, or did you just not think about it? <laughs> Giovanni plays that kind of part really well, as you know, that that kind of kind of psychopathic, you know, crazy kind of guy. You're not sure whether he's telling the truth or not. Why did you pin three murders on Dunbar? The man saved your life. Oh, so I should, I should cover up for his misdeeds? Huh? What, I was just telling you the truth. I really was. I... Not according to Pete Wilmer. Wilmer, Wilmer. Wilmer, Wilmer, Wilmer. Giovanni in particular was just fantastic. You know, I fought with him about Rosalind Sanchez. And he was saying, well, it's not realistic. 
And I was saying, well, no, not exactly realistic, but it's close to realistic. Actually, all these high-end units do have women in them. Uh, they just don't let them, they don't put them in a place where they're going to get shot on the ground. Mira, Papi. We just want to see your pack. We just want to see your pack because... Why? Because whoever shot the Sarge popped the grenade first. That's why. They had to put like 25 pounds of, of a sandbag all over my waist so I would like be more grounded and behave more like a man. Oh, it was so horrible. <laughs> and I'm like devastated. And uh, it took me two days to get over it because it was like a shock to see me. Like I'm a man, I'm a little boy. I, I'm, a, I'm a boy in this movie. Don't mimic no, we'll just go areas of her face. Cause no. see, I mean, you took that line right. and mimicked. Right, exactly. It violate the natural okay. lines of her face. All right. My part is not super big, you know what I mean? But the, the stuff that I have to do, he really made me go against what's written. And it's very challenging. I'm really, really tough. Bring her in here so she looks like a crazy person. Okay. You know, like very dangerous. Okay. Uh, she shows up out of the woods here and she's like being out in the boonies too long. Okay. okay. All right, perfect. With McTinn and I think it's intuitive. We knew what we were going to do once we read the script. He knows what he wants clearly and I know what I want clearly. We don't really talk about it. He has a very funny, funny way of explaining things to you, and I guess I've learned the shorthand because I was with him for so long. I was with him about six months on Die Hard with a vengeance. The whole of the line, you're pretty but dumb, one, two, one. When he goes, okay, we'll just try it again. I know that he means that, okay, that was good. And I got a lot of things I want, but there's something that I want to get that wasn't in that take, so if you can do it a little harder, maybe I'll get it in this take. Sam Jackson enters the bunker and rips the curtain down. That's all McTiernan. That's pure McTiernan, you know, where I would write something like, West walks through the door. And then you see the movie, and it's Sam Jackson going, <laughs> entering like, you know, God himself. And action. He's sort of known for doing the smart action movie. They're sort of the, the movies where just stuff blows up a lot, and then they're the John McTiernan movies, which actually have characters in the middle of stuff blowing up a lot and, and really interesting stories. So at the same time, this is also, I think, more of a, of a talky character piece than he's done before. I didn't realize how filmic he was, not doing the standard fare. I mean, he really had a, a very cinema verite or, or Godard-esque or Fellini-esque idea in his mind of how to do this movie. And I was very thrilled with that because it needed a twist. It had many twists in the scenario, but it also needed a visual twist. The whip pants from word to word to word to word. Incredibly difficult stuff. It was halfway through a word. You had to go at certain points and, and, and pan at certain points. And we kept on hitting various notes within it so that it would build this tension in the scene. Very difficult stuff to shoot. I could see as we worked together a bit in Jacksonville that our styles were different. And uh, I'm much more of the school of don't show your cuts, hide your cuts, try not to let anybody think about the editing, just let the scene play naturally. And I'd just say, look, cut that out, right there to there, boom, and then. He likes to use editing as a tool to keep the audience on its toes and excite the audience and energize the audience. And so I saw pretty early on that I would, it would be good for me to change my style. Once he caught on to what I was looking for for style, he could mimic the style fine. And then, then he brought a very good sense of story. With its Rashomon elements and all the twists and turns, especially the extraordinary twist at the end of the movie, um, I just felt this was going to be very, very tricky to, to get on screen. When you're doing investigative work and then you flash back to action and you have to jockey these two concepts together, you better have a, a fresh take on it. And he, he does. Turn on the rain, please. Turn on the wind. When I would 
infrequently go down to the set, I could see how he was really thinking and plotting and trying to figure out the camera moves and the style and how to make a picture that looks like an action picture on its surface, but really turns out to be a dialogue movie. He's been given permission in this particular movie to be a real filmmaker where he has no boundaries, really. The studio almost challenged him to say, look, make a film that you think is going to include the inspirations of your past. Yeah, please do. I think this is the first time that he's kind of joined commercial and art together, you know, because there's an artistic sense to this movie. And I think that we complemented each other. He's chosen in this movie to be more film noir, you know, more kind of uh, slightly avant-garde in his, in his uh, filmmaking, and I think it's right for this movie. You can't just play the same scene all over again. It has to accelerate. It has to be intensified. It has to play at a higher voltage the next time you see it. You keep going in deeper and deeper, and it keeps getting weirder and weirder and weirder, so that you have a sense that you're continually moving deeper into the jungle, if you will. Stop bringing up the wind and rain. Wind and rain. This is picture. Tracers coming. <laughs> right, just so they just miss it. Oh, right, 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 right. Now, we could spend the next four hours and try to time it so that it looked cool. <laughs> what we've got is a marker, a man over on the other side who will create a muzzle flash right there. And then, then we'll put in. Okay. Uh, tracers going through the frame that'll just miraculously just miss you. Okay, good. Hey, 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 sit! 
How you doing? Here we are in Panama. Panama, Florida. <laughs> I know enough to know that you've got two choices. You can sign a confession and spend the rest of your life in a cell, or you can tell us to off and be hanged. Am I scratching your surface yet? Well, why didn't you say something? We'll drop all the charges then. I'm serious. You serious, Raymond? Right now, we take the word of a crackhead over yours. You got something to say? Say it. Did Kendall tell you about the drugs? About the business Castro ran? What drugs? Stop. Kendall said Mueller found them with West Body. Well, he's lying then. And we didn't see Mueller until we got back to the bunker. Back up. Mueller was alone in the cabin? Yeah. I didn't buy it, but Mueller still had his grenade. Well, at least you and Kendall agree on that. What happened next? Uh, Pike came back. Stop. Kendall said that Mueller was the one that found them with West's body. Well, he's lying, then. We didn't see Mueller until we got back to the bunker. Back up. Mueller was alone in the cabin? Yeah. I didn't buy it, but Mueller still had his grenade. Well, at least you and Kendall agree on that. Stop. Kendall said that Mueller was the one that found them with West's body. He's lying, man. We didn't see Mueller until we got back to the bunker. Back up. Mueller was alone in the bunker? Yeah. Uh, I didn't buy it, but Mueller still had his grenade. Huh? Thank you. Can I have some more coffee? What? Yeah, yeah. Okay, set and background. And action. What happens to Dunbar now? In ten minutes he gets on a plane. Which means you're done. You'll understand if I don't walk you out. Good, please, good. Okay, we got that. And action. What? Dunbar wrote this when he asked for a ranger. It's got eight on it. Okay. I'll find out by myself. Stop. Okay. Section 8? Oh. Was that because they were crazy or the whole idea was crazy? <laughs> West recruited them to fight drugs? No. Oh. How could you not tell me that? It was classified. Oh, you are me here. <laughs> oh, you're on me here. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know. Okay. okay, ready? And action. <laughs> you feel lucky? Come on. Come on. Cut it. Action. Okay. So, are you happy? Huh? Uh, no. Good, good, good. That's the idea. Now, stay in his face a little bit. 
this thing comes down, he's got the gun up on you. I got this you. thing's gonna come down and hit him. And so poor Christian's gonna get hit again. Spun around and laid down so that it'll match into the the other shots we did of him blazing away. And it's again, it's it's a, another variation on exactly what happened before. Ah, uh, here we go, guys. Let's uh, ring up the wind and rain, please.
Cardi is a uh, clever, smart man who clearly can manipulate situations in people's minds um, to get what he needs to have done. I think it's always interesting to uh, not know exactly where a film is going to end up. And I think you really don't know how to figure this film out. And uh, the three or four scenarios that it reflects on is retroactively is so, you know, fascinating because it's a puzzle that one has to figure out. He's asserting his, his uh, you know, appeal to her in a very offhanded way, uh, roguish way, you know. She's just being the ultimate professional, but you can, she's playing it where you can see that she's uh, inadvertently attracted to him. With any great actor, other actors become better instantly because they give them the confidence, you know. And when I worked with, with Sam, I, I instantly became a better actor because uh, it, it, um, it inspires that. Tom McTurnan is a, um, a real filmmaker, you know, and I mean that in that he, he loves the camera, he knows where to put it, he, he has used fascinating angles and shots that I've, I, I find really interesting to watch his choices. She is someone who knows as little as everybody else uh, who's watching the movie, and therefore she's sort of the person who, have, who goes through uh, this, this maze of lies and, 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 and masks uh, with the audience to, to, to figure out what happened. She's a, a captain um, of the military police. She's a, the head of military police on this uh, little um, this little uh, station in, in um, military outpost um, in Panama, and it's getting closed down. Um, um, and then just before it's going to get closed down, with a big fanfare, a big. Um, a big, you know, to do with the defense, uh, Secretary of Defense coming down and everything. Uh, five people don't return from uh, a training, um, a, a basic training uh, uh, outing, and we have two witnesses, one of which won't talk, and the other one is wounded, and we suspect that they're dead, and I have to figure this thing out really fast so that this doesn't become an incident. John Travolta is really really a nice nice person he's really generous and he's been so much fun to work with as a matter of fact i really wanted him to be there at all times behind the camera because he he just really loved being in that character and it and it he would just do something to me that would just make me feel like you know you're you're brat and 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 and, and it would just come off immediately that you know we had this really funny competition going at all times and and that of course just worked perfectly for the scenes with this uh, kind of script, uh, which is a lot of, there's a lot of, 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 of banner, witty banter, he has found a way to, to put action in there through the camera. I think he's found like an aesthetic of the camera that, that I think makes every, every, um, every scene look completely different. And I think that, that it's a very um, uh, interesting um, way of using camera angles. If you look at him from the exterior, he's a very hard, cold, mean, no-nonsense kind of guy. Um, but that's the kind of guy that he has to be. Um, just because he's training a group of people to go out and do some things that could get them killed. Uh, and if they make mistakes while they're being trained, then they're going to die. John's like a, you know, a worker bee. He shows up to, to work. And if, if rain is the condition, that's the condition. Um, he has fun all the time. Even in the midst of all that rain and wind and mud and stuff, he was like joking and having fun. That's just John. That's the nature of doing the job. And I have that same attitude. If you can't have fun, then you shouldn't be doing it. He allows me to create things and bring things to the table that aren't particularly in the script that uh, flesh a character out. He allows me to fix the words so they fit in my mouth or in the character's mouth in a specific way. And 
he knows that I'm pretty efficient and that he doesn't have to shoot something like, you know, 15, 16 times to get it with me. It's, you know, shocking. It's um, got a very interesting twist at the end of it. Um, and I think it'll make audiences try and figure out, you know, who can get to the answer first. Ray is, is, is uh, you know, a special force slash ranger, and we are in, uh, you know, in the beginning of the movie, we're, we, it opens up as we're, we're in a, a training exercise that has gone awry, and, you know, throughout the movie, I am accused of murder, and I have to defend myself uh, 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 with, uh, with John Travolta's character, Hardy, and uh, Connie Nielsen's character, Osborne, Lieutenant Osborne. I'll admit, I have moments of, uh, where I'm, I'm, I'm looking across the table and I'm like, oh my God, that's, that's, that's John Travolta. It's really surreal sometimes. I have those moments where I have to like, you know, snap back into it. But he's the nicest guy in the world and it was really, you know, refreshing and I didn't know what to expect. You know, he's an icon. There's no one cooler than Sam Jackson. He's the guy. He's awesome. You know, I could watch him, you know, read the newspaper. He's that good. He's great. Something potentially horrific happened to a group of people who disappeared out in the jungle and you follow a couple of people trying to figure out what and it keeps getting it keeps unraveling and getting more and more dangerous whatever they're getting into um, until eventually the whole world turns upside down and nothing that you thought was had been going on is what was actually the truth the best thing about John is it's just irrepressible sense of joy um, and all the way back to Barbarino. It's just, no matter what he's doing, he's having, a, he's having a wonderful time doing it. I kind of like that way of telling a story where you can, you know, you can start almost anywhere and uh, you find a bunch of people, you know, lying and believing them. And then you see the kind of, the audience has to kind of make, make up the inconsistencies of the story. You know, was he, was he telling the truth or was he lying? Two guys come back, four guys have disappeared, and where are they, what happened, why were they shooting at each other? And then you have these two guys who came back to start to tell a story. And as they tell a story, one of them is lying, or both of them are lying. We're not sure, because one of the main characters that they're talking about has disappeared. He did a lot of research on it. You know, he went off on ranger school. He went off to figure out exactly what he needed to do to be that guy. And, um, you know, he's got a real likability. I mean, people really like him. You know, they like his smile, they like his persona. I'm a jet pilot. I've been flying for 30 years. It's my other passion in life. I love it very much. I play a drug enforcement agent who's uh, investigating the murders and uh, possible drug cartel that's happening in the military in Panama. <laughs> Last night was the first time we'd actually been on camera together since Pulp Fiction, so uh, it was like a reunion of sorts. And John and I have a great relationship, so when we see each other, we're always very happy to see each other. I've been murdered, and these young men and one young woman have uh, been brought in, and they're being questioned about what happened. Uh, and everyone has a different version. Is that your service? I am picked up for the murder of four or five of my uh, compatriots. You got something to say? Say it. I have a witness that I have to get to talk to me about what happened, and he's refusing to talk to me. At this point, they call in somebody else to replace me and that is not a great situation <laughs> for me. Uh, and it's John Travolta's character, Tom Hardy. Oh, that's good, Ray. You know I'm DEA. And you figure you say drugs and you think I'm all ears. Action, person you wanna be. We don't know if he's a, a good guy or a bad guy. What? I don't hear. And uh, he's very experienced, very savvy, and uh, clever. It's about the less appealing side of, you know, what could go on in a military environment, you know, whether it's with a 
drugs or murder or uh, all this kind of thing. It's a very dark road, but very intriguing all at once. You know, Pulp Fiction was like that too. Candle tell you about the drugs. It's a whodunit. It is also a mind game. It is also about um, how uh, our beliefs can be manipulated. Stop. Kendall said that Mueller was the one that found them with Wes's body. Oh, you're lying, man. You um, continually see different versions of what everyone interprets uh, what happened to him in the middle of that training mission. And um, it's confusing, but everyone will be able to draw a certain conclusion from what they see, to see what's real and what's not. You know, I used to hang out in trees when I was a kid. Never any 